so hello everyone. I'm Ria. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a really short quest design um, lecture today. Um, just really quickly, a bit about me. It's not about me, but I'm sure that you're going to want to know who I am at least to some degree. I am um, the narrative director, or one of the narrative directors on Beyond Skyrim Cyrodiil. Um, I've been there for about three years now, and I've been a director for about two of them, or a year and a half or so. Um, I am mostly in charge of editing and quality control, but I've done plenty of my own writing as well. Um, I also write novels and short stories, um, which you can find on Amazon, not, you know, just saying. Um, and I am... I also, my day job is writing um, is a, is as a narrative designer at Fusebox Games, which is a narrative um, indie studio, uh, an indie studio um, based on he um, heavy story-driven narrative games uh, based in London. Um, so I do a lot of writing. That's basically all my life <laughs> at this point, um, but I love it to pieces. So hopefully I can um, share some of that with you today. I'm going, I'm going to be talking about quest design specifically. So. Um, the first question, I guess, that we have to answer is, what is quest design? Um, there isn't really an easy answer for this. Um, just to be really blunt, the industry, um, we we'll talk about the industry very briefly, but the industry can be a little bit, um, can vary a little bit about what these things mean. These are just various briefs about things that, uh, for different quest design positions. And you might notice that a few of them offer, looking for different things, some of them might offer um, some will be focused on narrative, while some will be more heavily focused on design and scripting, which will require you to learn a programming language. Quest design uh, is, a, is, a, is an emerging discipline. It's not very well defined, necessarily. Um, some studios will have house tools that they'll require you to learn, whereas others will not, um, like equivalent to the, the creation kit for Skyrim. Um, but the bottom line is, the thing that you want to take away from this is that quest design is not the same discipline as writing. Um, it is, as, is within the sphere of writing and creative and narrative design, um, but you know it's, it is a different, it is a slightly different uh, discipline. And in a, in a big studio, it is a different job description to, from a writer. Um, there are these three spheres which kind of overlap a lot, which are writer, narrative designer, and quest designer. Um, and again, technically, in a in a in an, in an AAA, a AAA studio. These things will mean different things. But in an indie studio or something like Beyond Skyrim, where um, people aren't as specialized, you might find yourself doing all three of these things, which is basically why I'm giving this um, lecture. Because in Beyond Skyrim, we don't require you to learn any programming. We don't require you to learn the creation kit. The only thing you need to do quest design is an ability to write quests. So a writer, a narrative designer, and a quest designer in Skyrim, in Beyond Skyrim, are all the same thing. Um, in a big studio, You'd have designers that would write quests. Uh, oh, in, you'd have designers that would do some writing, designers that won't. Um, in Skyrim's actual production, Bethesda had um, people do all three jobs. But um, over time, studios are moving away and kind of and moving away from that model and making them quite their own spheres of um, their own spheres, their own disciplines. Um, basically, the bottom line is these things mean different things to different people. So always check your job descriptions if you're looking to go into the industry. Make sure that you. Um, Make sure that you know what the job entails. Don't just look at the thing that says quest design and be like, that sounds like something I could do because they could be quite different from each other. Um, as you become more senior, you'll generally specialize in one of these three things. Um, so, um, but as uh, if you start a lower level, like I said, in an indie studio, then you'll probably want, you'll probably have be doing all of these things, which is great because Beyond Skyrim prepares you to do all of these things. Um, because as I said, a writer on Beyond Skyrim will, um, will, have their fingers in all of these pies, so it's a good it's a good way to get experience. Um, just just to say, I started as a writer on Beyond Skyrim, like I said, and then I became a narrative director, and then it was my my experience on uh, Beyond Skyrim that allowed me to get a job in the industry. So it's a very very much a path that you can take. Um, it's a very useful experience. Um, so that doesn't really answer a question of what actual quest design is, which has basically said that they're all different things. Um, Quest designers make quests. That's that. That's basically quite obvious from the name. But quests are again can be quite different things. Um, in a quest can take a very long time to make if it's a very large, big thing with lots of different people working on it, or it can be one person plodding away at their computer, like what we do on Beyond Skyrim. Um, 
A quest, in essence, is a just a small contained narrative, uh, a piece of narrative work that has a beginning and an end, has objectives for the player to complete along the way, uh, sometimes will chain together to create quest lines or quest chains, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, there are a lot of disciplines and skills that go into these things, so it's not that easy to just pick up and do. Um, and again, you will be, you know, these are specialized disciplines in the, in, as, you, as you move up. Um, but, you know, it's still really fun to do all of these things and it's really good um, to get the experience. Um, uh, things to remember, just that the purpose of each quest is different. So the purpose of the quest designer for each quest will be different. Knowing what that purpose is before you go in is really important. And not all quests are created equally. Some are bigger than others, some are more important than others, some will have more resources than others. So it's always just really important to think about where your quest, if you're designing a quest, um, how does it relate to the wider world? Where does it fit into the project that you're a part of? Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, so just to be clear, I'm focusing on narrative quest design in this presentation. So we're talking about writing um, writing quests from a, from a narrative point of view, from a writer's point of view, not the design of quests where you implement things into the game, um, create the set pieces and stuff. That's the more technical uh, quest design position that you'll often find in bigger studios. Um, so again, what is, uh, how, do you, how do we do quest design? What is quest design? Um, quest design, making quests. How do I make a quest? Um, I will kind of go through this in the lens of Beyond Skyrim, how we do it on Beyond Skyrim. Um, but these things should be applicable to other disciplines and other games and other projects as well. Um, and you know, Beyond Skyrim, as I said, is a great experience because it allows you to do a bit of everything. Um, so, and if although you don't have to learn the creation kit to do Beyond Skyrim quest implementation, it is also a very useful skill for some employers. And it's very easy for you to pick up if you're on a project with other people who are already doing it, because I've done that myself. Um, even though I'm not great at it, um, it's quite hard to do. Um, but um, it is a very good thing to do if you feel like um, you're up for it. It will also help you understand your engine and what your limitations are and what you're working in. Um, but I will be focusing on the narrative aspect rather than the technical aspect. So the first thing you want to do is come up with the quest, come up with the concept, come up with the skeleton of the quest, um, like this guy. You want to come up with a skeleton. Um, these are basically, these are the most important steps. Now, you don't have to do them in this order, but these are the things that you want to be thinking about as you start. You want to outline your quest. You want to decide on the location. You want to decide on the themes and the purposes. You want to come up with a very bare buttons outline of the start and the finish. You want to pick a location. Where does it fit into the wider, wider world? Um, and you want to decide on your dramatis personae, which is a very literary term, but basically it just means your main characters, um, your important characters for this quest. Um, my advice is also to think about your outcomes before you think about your intros. So think about the end before you think about the beginning, because the thing about narrative quest design for games is that you will have branching and different outcomes for your quests quite a lot of the time. And thinking about them early is very important because you need, you need to know what you're working towards and um, what, how many outcomes, what kind of outcomes your quests are going to have. Um, starting from the beginning and then just branching willy-nilly is... <laughs> can be done, but it's very, it can lead to very bloated quests and very disorganized and unfocused quests. Once you have your skeleton, your ideas, um, and you've got them all together, the first thing you want to do is map it out. You want to map out all of the quest stages. And this is what we use flowcharts for. I have two of them here, um, stolen from Skip Cyrodiil writers. I didn't make either of these. I shamelessly stole them. One of them is made by Leftover Pat. Um, these are... Um, these are flowcharts. Um, what they do is, if you're not familiar with a flowchart, it basically shows the pr progression from beginning to end and all the different steps along the way um, to get um, to, to, to go through a quest. Um, they are very, very important for narrative design, uh, not just for quests, but in all aspects of narrative design. Um, they're very important for allowing you and, more importantly, other people um, to easily get a sense of what your quest is, how it flows, where the main choice points are, um, where the, uh, what the different outcomes are. You will basically need to create one of these for every single quest that you write, unless it's, an unless it's literally a linear quest of one, two, three, four, five, six, which is not very often because we do encourage, at least on Beyond Skyrim, we encourage a level of branching and, and a, level of, um, a level of replayability and interactivity with the quest. 
some studios, if you go to work, other studios will focus more on the story and the um, the emotional story and less on the technical side of things and will have a very simple beginning to end. You may not need to create flowcharts for them, but it's still a very good choice. It's a very good skill to have. So this is your outline. Once you've, so once you've, once you've got all of your, your ideas together and you've pieced it all together, and you, then you've created this, which is essentially your outline, your blueprint. You know, this is the quest stage one, then there's this stage, then you do this choice. Then the actual, the next thing to do is to write the quest, to draft the quest. Um, have fun. Um, I'm not going to go through like, you know, actual writing in this lecture because it's more about um, the, the designing side of it. Um, but this is obviously actually the main bulk of your work um, on Beyond Skyrim. This is when you write the lines, you, you introduce the characters, you give uh, information for the implementers so that they can put it into the game. Um, although I'm not going to talk about the you know actual writing because there's plenty of really great lectures on that already um, at the Arkane University, um, I will talk about a few um, concepts of quest design, things that you're going to want to be thinking about as you write, but also as you outline um, and all of that kind of stuff. And then obviously after writing, you have your other things that you need to think about, like balancing or um, um, redrafting and editing, but that's more of a, again, that's more of a, a, a writing thing than a quest design thing. Um, this is a real picture of me um, writing my last quest, uh, in case you're wondering, this is, this is the process, um, it's very fun. Um, so first thing we want to talk about um, is branching. Uh, branching is one of the most important tools that you have for creating interesting and reactive narratives. Um, you, um, you, branching is, is, is the, it, you'll see a lot of people talking about branching when you, when you, when you, uh, when you read up about narrative design, um, and stuff like this. Um, you'll see people maybe like talking about it in a very academic way. It's a very, it's a very well-studied subject. Uh, exa for example, this, um, this diagram. Um, is a uh, what's known as a bottle narrative. Um, as you can see, it kind of resembles a bottle where you will have choice points which expand and then contract again, um, which will um, you know funnel the player through certain points. So every player will get to um, those orange squares before the end, before finally giving a very a, a bunch of different outcomes. Um, there are other kinds of narratives, obviously. Um, they all resemble things and have different names, but it's not too important at this point. The most important thing is to understand branching and how it can be used. Um, branching is, simply put, it's just when you um, when you branch and you give different um, outcomes for different players based on um, choices that they make, um, or even things like things that happen under the hood, like the race of the character that they play, or the um, the items that they have or have not. You, that they are carrying or are not carrying, and so so on and so forth. Um, branching in quest design is unique to games and is in, very important for quest design because it's the thing that allows the player to feel like the world is reactive. That's the power of games: is to immerse players in the world itself to feel like the world is reacting to what they do, um, and that the characters are real and you know are having are. are changing their out, their actions based on what you do, which is really, really important. It's one of the main reasons why I think games are so immersive and so incredible, um, because you can really get lost in them if you, you know, in a way that you can't viewing something from the outside, like a book or a game. You know, you're, the player is the center of the attention. So branching is your main tool to, you know, encompass that, to, to keep them engaged and to keep them on their toes, feeling like they matter. Um, that's the goal at the end of the day. Um, the important thing to think about branching is that it is an incredibly powerful tool, but you know, need to know when to use it. You have to think about the economics of branching. There is, a, there is an effort versus a gain reward for every time you branch. There are you know, there are high level branches and low level branches, um, high level, low level branches are really small things like slight dialogue changes, um, which don't actually affect the outcome of the quest, but might give you a small cosmetic difference in the short term. Those are really easy to achieve, but they have like a low reward, like the, that level of, um, 
that level of immersion is not that impressive. It's kind of expected in a lot of games. So players won't be like, wow, I can't believe that guy reacted negatively to me, to me when I said something negative to him. They'll expect that. The higher level choices are the things that affect the world more dramatically, more profoundly. And those things are things that will, um, that will require more work, either on, you, on your part or on the work of the implementers and um, uh, level designers and other disciplines. So you need to remember that when you create these branches, they can be incredibly powerful tools, um, but they also impact other people. Um, the more you do this and the more widely you do this, the more other people might have to accommodate for you, the more other disciplines um, in, the, in, the, in the team will have to do more work. And as a writer, you have a lot of power in this respect. So you need to learn basically to temper your instincts. You need to be like, I could write uh, a quest, and believe me, we've all done it, but you could be like, I, I, I want to write a quest with 10 different outcomes and uh, like a whole huge cast of players, that all, uh, of, of characters that all say different things depending on which order you do the objectives in, and it's completely non-linear, and you can pick it up from five different locations in the world. But at the end of the day, the novelty and the, the, the game that you'll get for the players, the players will only see one of those paths, and they will only be able to you know enjoy it as much as they are willing to like play it over and over and over and over again which is not very likely so the effort that you put into something like that needs to have an equal reward and in that case very often <laughs> unless it's incredibly justified for some reason that's not going to that's not going to give you back that reward um remember that Every time you branch, you're splitting your player base. So there is a certain percentage of players that will play your quest. In a big open world RPG with hundreds of quests, that could be a small percentage of players. So even if you have a million players uh, and only 10% of them start your quest, every time you branch, you're splitting that down to 5%, 2.5%, and so on like that. Like it, it diminishes very, very quickly. So putting lots of effort into very large branches can be very rewarding, but you need to, again, need to think about who's playing it, how many people are actually going to see this, and um, you know, where, where, is the, where are the most important points for you to branch? Where are the most important and impactful ways that you can branch and things like this? It kind, that kind of leads me onto the question I have, which is what makes a good choice in video games because that's what you're kind of asking yourself you're always asking where can i put these branches um, to create the most impact and these choice points are really important to think about so i'm going to ask is anybody here if there's any volunteers anybody can tell me what they think makes a good choice in a video game anyone one with both positive and negative consequences for your actions Cool, exactly. So one which um, one which basically what you're saying is um, that are you saying like one where um, both choices have both positive and negative outcomes, or where one is positive and one is negative? Um, both have a little bit of a gray area in terms of what happens. There's going to be good and bad happening despite your choice. Right. That it, that's great. That's that's the nuance that you're looking for. So that's the kind of thing where the player needs to know. And they need to know these things in advance of the choice. They need to be set up to expect these things. That whatever their choice happens, there's going to be good things and bad things for it. So it's kind of like a, exactly, you're balancing the outcomes. Because if one choice is really obviously good and one choice is really obviously bad, then no one's ever going to choose the good points. For me, um, is there anybody else, by the way? Anybody else got any ideas before I move on? I personally believe that even though those morally um, gray ones are very good to have, if you make every single question that kind of thing, like every single choice, those kind of events, it can tire out the player. So I think just having smaller ones that just have a result of some kind are also important. Yep. And again, that comes back to your economics of high level versus low level. How many high level, big, important choices are you going to have in every quest? You, you don't need loads. Um, I I like the choices that give you more role play, like not like the morally choices, but like the character has a chance to show his like mm, character, like uh, who he is, like what kind of player yeah. a character is trying to achieve in the game. Yeah, uh, 
So you're saying like race like bonuses in terms of how ah, it designed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like locations like an underwater crypt or something? Or yeah, like, you end up the having first to... thing that comes to my mind is like in like which one we pick like you you pick like the elves or the humans. Like one are like rebellious. Uh, like there was the moral ground in it, but also like just picking sides. Like the like uh, as a kid, like I I like the uniform <laughs> of one bit more, and, and I I like that. Like having um be, being able to pick. Like I don't know if it makes sense. So. Oh. I, I think I understand you. Um, I think one thing that you mentioned there that's really important is also self-expression, uh, being able to express the kind of player that you are. Um, this is another thing. Um, you can have just, just th this is the value of even the low level choices is that you can have just three different ways to respond to the same thing that don't change the outcome, but allow you to express yourself as a player because there is that role playing aspect, that aspect of being immersed in the world and feeling again, like you're part of it and that your character is a real person. You want to be able to express that. You want to be able to, um, you know, you want to be able to be consistent with your character. Um, this is something that we we tell new recruits a lot: is that you really actually need to think a lot about when you give a dialogue choice, even if it doesn't affect the outcome of anything. It's just, you know, someone gives you something, and you have three different ways to respond to it. Um, those things, those those three different ways, are really important to get right because you want to be able to somehow. It's very difficult, but you need to encompass all different types of players within just three or four choices so that nobody feels like their character has to speak out of character for the purposes of this one quest. If all of the responses sound very similar, they're all very positive or they're all very dismissive, then you'll break the immersion for a lot of characters and there'll be people will be upset about that, naturally. Um, there is um, something, uh, there is a concept of the three choice rule in, um, in game design sometimes where you have three choices and one is positive, one is negative, and one is neutral or weird or funny. Um, and this kind of like thing is, this, the whole point of this is to basically encompass as many different types of people as possible um, who are playing the game. Um, yeah, so good choices are really important for me. I would say the most important thing to think about when you when you think about choices are the stakes. Are uh, to think about um, why, um, like what is at stake every time someone makes a choice. Um, what will be going through the player's head? Um, what are the things at risk for them? What are the things that they stand to gain or lose? Um, this is more for the big, important choices, obviously. Um, but those things are the things that make people stop and think about the choice. For me, I don't know if anybody's ever played Banner Saga, but that was uh, personally a really brilliant um, exploration of really impactful choices because a lot of that game was based around making really um, making choices that it was very clear from the beginning had high stakes every single time. And often those stakes weren't just narrative stakes, they could be gameplay stakes. But if you are emotionally connected to the players enough and this uh, to the characters, this relies on your good writing skill, then you will, you know, there will be choices where you can, there is a clearly beneficial option that is just better than the other one because it gives you better material, like in terms of resources or something gameplay wise. But, there will, but it will force you to be mean or like to leave someone behind that you care about. And although that has no gameplay out, outcome, it's only a story outcome, if you can marry those two concepts together really well, um, you have, can create an incredibly powerful narrative and incredibly powerful choices where the player might have to choose between a material gameplay benefit or an emotional benefit or an emotional gain of keeping someone that they care about or something like that. Um, always thinking about what the player stands to lose and gain, it, I think, is the most important thing when you make these choices. And finding the places within the quests where those things are at their highest um, for the big, important choices. And then for the low-level choices, giving them um, chances to chances to express themselves and chances to, to keep interacting with the story and keep them engaged without having them to making them have to think about the, like making a massive choice every single time. Um, that's branching. Uh, the next thing I was going to move on to talk about um, is outcomes and rewards, which is closely related to branching. Um, there are obviously different ways you can write a quest. You can write a quest which has multiple outcomes, or you can write a quest which only has a single outcome. Um, both of these, again, have pros and cons. Again, 
every time you write a quest, one person is only ever going to see one outcome. There is an element of illusion sometimes in games where people, where game designers will make you think like you had an outcome on the game, even though you didn't. Um, if this is successful, then it can be very, very useful. Um, the most important thing for players is to make them feel like they're in, they 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 want they feel like they're in control that the, the world is changing around them that they are part of a real living breathing world. The way you can make, there are two ways to make people feel like that. You can pretend that that's the case and make them think that it's the case, or you can actually make it the case. And I'm not going to say that one is better than the other because one requires a lot more effort, but the other um, has potential to um, to be to be seen through. Um, or for people to be annoyed about it if they if they realize what's going on. One game that games that I always um, say have like a huge amount of illusion of choice, but not actually very much choice, are Telltale games. If anybody's ever played those before, they can have huge, impactful, large branching points, but very often though they are not actually impactful. They seem like they are, and they present they're presented as if they are. But when you go and look behind the scenes, you realize that, and if you watch other people play the game, you realize that most of it is almost identical, um, the story all the way through. If you can do that really well, then that's another tool in your toolbox. But it's also worth thinking about, you know, is it worth sometimes just actually making the game change? The 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 um the con of that obviously is then having to put in a lot more effort to create these extra outcomes. Um, you can also create outcomes and rewards that are not materially different from each other, but feel like they're different from each other. So you can have different outcomes that aren't that don't really change anything in the world, um, but have emotional impact, um, emotional and perceived impact. Um, you know, on the part of the player where, where, you know, they feel like they've upset someone that they care about, or they feel like, you know, they've someone, there's a line at the end of someone's dialogue where he says, oh, I'm really sad. I'm going to go away and do this now, X, or I'm going to leave forever. It can be such a small material change in the world that changes barely anything, but has a massive emotional impact on the player if they cared about that character. And those things are just as valid, just as important as actually changing the world. I think I see a lot of, um, a lot of um, you know, new games writers who look at really branchy, really reactive games like The Witcher 3. And don't get me wrong, I love The Witcher. It's one of my favorite games. But we'll think that they need to do that for every single quest. When in reality, um, you, using your tools effectively is, um, you know, and choosing the right time to make those make those big outcomes is just as important. And you can achieve a lot with really good writing, with just telling someone um, something in literally just saying, having a character say something that is different now, even though the world might not change. That can, that can feel like a really different outcome from, um, from a different, from if they had said something different, basically. Uh, and finally, when talking about outcomes and rewards, it's also important to think about rewards themselves. And thinking about how rewards can also um, can also incentivize players to you know play again or play differently or to you know to keep playing in in some respects, um, dangling interesting rewards in front of them is really good. Um, and especially if your game has a reputation for that, or say your mod project has a reputation for that, uh, if you're able to keep giving the players interesting rewards, they will keep playing more quests because it's just a nice thing to feel like your reward is tailored to you rather than here's, here's my old family sword and then you get given a iron sword of draining and you realize that it is literally just a leveled list uh, that's just a gen generically um, generated list uh, of swords that he's just given you one of and you think, wow, oh, okay, yeah, well, that's clearly not actually his sword. But in, instead of like creating unique assets for every outcome, you can give novel rewards in different ways. Um, things like um, th th giving rewards, like um, things like uh, just new dialogue options counts as well. Like things like new dialogue options. Um, houses is a very common one in Skyrim, so uh, or in um, Skyrim and Oblivion and Elder Scrolls games in general. But things thinking outside the box, skill ups. Um, New dialogue entries, um, new characters to speak to, um, new like a new location to unlock. Um, um, even if it's not just a weapon, but some kind of enchanted thing that uses reuses an asset. Like I think one of the really interesting rewards, even though it's really kind of plain 
in Oblivion was for one of the quests, you could get a scale as a reward, and it would give you bartering upgrades if you carried it around with you. Uh, stuff like that um, that isn't just your sword that you're going to sell to the vendor in five minutes. Um, those kind of rewards that feel like they're tailored to the quest are really important to think about. And they're not, it's not just about what you, the player has in their inventory, but what they see in the world um, and um, you know, emotionally what kind of reward they might get as well. Um, the next thing to talk about is types of quests and activities that you can do. Um, this is also important for designing your quests, is being able to balance these things. Um, every game has what you might call a gameplay loop or gameplay pillars, which is um, you can see on the side. Um, Skyrim basically follows the, um, this triangle of combat versus dialogue versus stealth or exploration. Those are your kind of like three pillars of gameplay. Um, and every quest, ideally, will try to, um, will try to have a balanced uh, amount of these. Some will be focused on one particular thing. Some will be a quest where you just talk to a lot of people, and that's totally fine. But then you also need to think about the wider world. You want to be able to balance different types of quests within, within a region. So if you have one very heavy dialogue quest in a city, you don't want another one right next door. You want a hack and slash or an exploration quest. Or if you have one that has two of these, you want to make sure that you get the third one in somewhere as well um, in a different quest. It's not just writing the quest itself, but also thinking about how it fits into the wider world that's really important here. Um, there are so many different things that you can do. I think it's really important to remember and understand the engine that you're working in. So for Skyrim, that's just understanding the creation kit and its limitations, but it is a very powerful tool. Um, but for any other game that you work on, any other product that you work on, understanding the quest, the, the designers, the designers tools, understanding the implements that you're working with and what your limitations are, are extremely important. I always encourage you to understand these things. And if you are, you know, a writer <coughs> who doesn't have any kind of um, daily interaction with these things, talk to the designers on your team, understand um, what can and can't be done. Um, just because it's it's nice on your it's 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 good for you and it's, it saves you time, but it also is courteous to other people. Um, and then when you have this idea of the different things that you can do, like there are some examples here, like dungeon delving, puzzle solving, boss battles, searching for an, exp an item, exploration. There's a lot of different things. When you have an idea of these different things, try just try to give a balance of these things. Try to think about again, go back to the themes of your quest and what the themes are. Is this you know, if this is a quest about um, magical, uh, you know, if this is a quest about Julianos um, and about magical, um, magical stuff and um, about um, knowledge, then there'll be a lot of exploration and puzzle solving. Um, if it's a fighter's guild quest, then generally you might have a lot of combat, but that doesn't mean that you don't want to um, think about the other things as well, because they're all important. And if you play, if you end up doing too much of one thing, you will get bored. An RPG is all about having, you know, the whole shebang, the whole experience. Um, you also want to decide on a degree of freedom and open-endedness. This kind of goes back to the branching, but how many different ways can the player achieve one objective? Um, if the objective is just to find an item, how many different ways are there that they can get to that item? Um, this comes into level design, which might not be um, what you're doing, but you can always give pointers and ideas um, to the people who are doing it to make it more interesting. Um, thinking about games like um, Dishonored, which is not uh, nothing to do with the writing itself, but the design of the missions were incredibly good. And that was a combination of the quest design and the level design. Um, there was always multiple ways to, to solve every situation. So, and that kind of level of interactivity and freedom is really, really appreciated by people. Again, there is an economy to it. There is a cost versus, a cost versus reward. You can't be doing this all the time for every single objective, but it's worth thinking about where it might be the most impactful or interesting. Um, and just, yeah, encourage different types of gameplay. Um, it's a really important thing to do when you're designing quests. Um, and yeah, the, the, the final thing that I'm going to talk about is um, that little special something, which is not really a, not a technical term before anybody asks. That's not an industry term. But it is something that I like to think about that I think is, 
I think that it's really interesting. So when you think about your favorite quests in any game that you've ever played, and I think Who Done It from Oblivion from the Dark Brotherhood quest line is a really great example of this because everyone talks about this as if it's like their favorite quest in the world. Um, when you think about these these quests, um, I would ask you to also think about what are what what are the things in those quests that make them the most memorable quests, your favorite quests that you've ever played? There's always an element of something special in there. Um, in in the case of Who Done It, it has a, a couple of these things that I've written at the side. Um, these are just suggestions, but it could be so many things: dungeon design, premises, set pieces, rewards. All these things are important, and just making one of them like stand out in some interesting way, some way that's new that players haven't seen before, will instantly elevate your quest, will instantly make it more memorable in, in, in many people's minds. Um, always trying to look for what is interesting and different about this quest. Every quest is unique. So if your quest is about fetching an item, what is unique about fetching an item in this quest that makes your one memorable? It's really hard to do this for quest upon quest upon quest. If you make 5, 10, 15 of these things, and you have your fellow writers doing the same thing over and over and over again, there's always going to be overlap. But searching for that thing every time, even if you don't find it, um, is important, I think, because it then it gives you the chance to create something really, really good and really, really interesting. Um, and just, just spend some time thinking about your favorite quests and why you like them. Why, what is special about them, other than all of the technical things that we might have already talked about? Um, I'm, 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 we've got a little bit of time. Um, I'm ahead of schedule. So if anybody wants to tell me, what are your favorite quests? Um, what do you think is special about them? Please do go ahead if anybody has any ideas. You took my choice on this slide. OK. <laughs> what, what, what is interesting about Who Done It, though? Why do you like it so much? Well, it's the ability to trick others into attacking each other. It's the ability to be sadistic and manipulative at the same time. It's something that most games do not give you the option to do in most quest lines, is to not just be an asshole, but to get away with it in such a way where your actions have consequences, it's just not your own to deal with. And the good thing about that, I think, <clears throat> is that it folds into the Dark Brotherhood narrative. That's the whole point that anybody starts the Dark Brotherhood quest line is to kill people, to have to be silly and, and sadistic in a video game. So, you know, some people won't want that, but the people for the people that do have this amazing quest. And that goes back to thinking about the themes and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I would say that that comes out under a strange premise um, or a. Um, I would uh, say this was... quest is probably the quintessence of the Dark Brotherhood's theme. It uh, felt a bit like you were actually playing Hitman instead of Elder Scrolls. Are there any others that anybody has apart from Who Done It? Any any others that anyone wants to volunteer? Yeah, and, um, Go ahead. adding on to the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, to the Dark Brotherhood, I really like that quest back in Oblivion where, um, where your targets were all invited to a party and you had to assassinate every single one of them. You had to make absolutely sure that none of them realized that you're the one responsible. That's who done it. <laughs> Yeah, that um, is the quest that we talk about. But, oh, that's the name of it. Okay. Te uh. Yeah, that's testament to the fact that it's so popular that everyone is thinking of that one. Okay, never mind then. Sorry. There was <laughs> some Skyrim ones that are actually stand out. One of the ones that I really enjoyed on the Skyrim front was if you actually took the time to go to the Windhelm docks, you could see the East Empire Company being messed around with, and you could end up helping them. And it was just vastly different location because where you have in other areas events where people just walk around and attack and stuff you actually have an entire battle scenario put in place in this quest which made it stand out from most things because otherwise you'd only see that in the civil war quest line which was heavily cut before it was released that's a very level designer thing to say as your favorite quest Fair. <laughs> I think my favorite quest is actually a miscellaneous quest from Skyrim. 
that is the Siege of the Dragon Cold quest. The player is uh, supposed to um, to go through an old dragon called Ruin and they can just find a lot of um, world building and a lot of environmental storytelling. Um, as the player basically comes across different notes that retell that uh, the dragon cultists who were trapped in this 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 fortress, um, they they were under siege, and in their desperation, they poisoned their own well to just you know die a a, a, a martyr's death or just take the enemies with them. And it's just awesome to see that um, you can do so little with good level design and just good notes that are um, inside the you know dungeon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, one hundred percent. Collaborate with your level designers as well to make these. That's another thing. Like um, one of the things I think here was an interesting dungeon design. That's not something that you have power over, but it is something that has the power to make a really good quest. So collaborating with someone else to to make that happen is really important. Remember that, like I said earlier, in a big AA, in a big AAA studio, all of this thing is the, the design of a quest can take a long time shared across a lot of people. Um, on Beyond Skyrim, most of it is down to one or two people, um, but it is really important to you know collaborate in that respect because um, those are the, the ones where lots of people come together to make something really special. Are the ones that you know make really great quests as well. I thought the beginning of the dark, the Brotherhood quest line was strong, where you find the kid in that house. If I, do I remember correctly? I think that's the one where you find the kid in the window. The uh, he loses his family or something, mm-hmm. then he basically that player basically is somehow led there, but without player knowing what he finds. I really always found that kid in that house very strong, uh, like a icon, because like it's a young kid who's dealing with stuff he's not supposed to. That's what I remember out from that quest, and then. You're just drawn into a whole different part of the world, which is the Dark uh, Brother. It's almost like a MacCuffin, but it really is not. But might as well. Like the kids carry on throughout the storyline in Dark Brother, where you kill the um, the head of the orphanage. So the kids are constantly woven into the storyline, like the 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 lore of the Dark Brother in different, different segments of the story. And that's how it starts, with a kid. That's always what I thought of this, the uh, the kid in that house. Strong. I like that story. Um, yeah, totally. Sorry, I was saying yes, but my microphone was not picking it up. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've got, a, yeah, the, I use this as an example, but there's so many good examples. Um, to think about, not just in Skyrim and Oblivion, but in lots of RPGs. And even in, uh, I know someone in the chat mentioned Dishon- Dishonored as well. Games like Hitman or Dishonored that have like a kind of, um, that are more based around the level design, but have an interesting story attached to them. Those are really useful learning experiences as well, because it, it that those are good, uh, they're good learning um, tools for learning how to create a narrative um, within like a, a set story that already exists or like within a level that already exists. Um, those sorts of things we will do on Beyond Skyrim as well, where we create dungeons and we have a writer go in and write a story for that dungeon and having the constraints of that dungeon already given to you. Um, but creating something really interesting out of that um, can be a challenge, but can be very rewarding for the players as well, even if it's just some notes um, or some level, you know, some aspect of the level design um, is equally important, I think. Um, yeah, OK, uh, in that case, um, we will. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I will open it up to questions, uh, which is what we usually do at the end of these things. Um, we've got some time. If there are any questions, uh, please go ahead. If not, that's also OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have one question. Uh, I don't know if like being in game design, if ageism is like a thing. But I had always wondered if, like, because uh, I'm 31, 
And when I finish my game design degree, I'll probably be 35 years old. So I've wondered if ageism was a thing or not. That's a, that's a really tough question. I mean, I, th I, I think it is. Sorry, who's... I, 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 think it, I, th I think there is definitely an aspect of it. People, new studios, uh, big studios often want to hire people who, um, who want to kind of, um, big studios will often want to hire people who like uh, fresh out of uni. But I think, um, I think if you find the right studio, um, it shouldn't be a problem. I worked under uh, a really amazing lady whose name is Heidi McDonald, who may watch this one day. So if you are watching this, Heidi, thank you very much. And um, you're great. Um, but I worked under um, um, a lovely lady named Heidi McDonald um, for a while. And she, um, I don't, I don't want to say her age, but I believe that she's in her, um, I believe that she's in her 50s and she only got into gaming and she only got into games writing at the age of like uh, in her 40s or um, uh, late 30s, if I'm not mistaken. So it's 100 percent possible. And um, there's, you know, it, it 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 might be slightly more difficult. But, um, you know, if you find the right place for you, who's willing to do it, and who's willing to you know take you on, um, it, it, it you'll be fine. Um, I don't want to say I don't want to say too much on it because I've never you know I'm quite young I've never experienced it myself so um, it's hard for me to say um, but yeah I wouldn't let it discourage you 100%. Heidi says that you know this is what she's wanted to, you know she 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 did loads of jobs before becoming a writer uh, for games and she's never she's never enjoyed any of them as much as she's enjoyed writing so you know if that's what you want to do then you should totally go for it. Um, if I if I may butt in on the whole age argument. Um, so I have no, no experience in the game development industry, whatever, but the age discussion exists in, in all industries and especially in IT. And of course, companies like to hire young people, um, if for no other reason that someone fresh out of college is usually cheap to hire. Um, uh, but you know, on the other hand, they don't have the experience of someone older and if it's just life experience or you know, just the sheer amount of, of media you've consumed over the years. You know, there's the old adage or the old saying, uh, to write well, you have to read a lot. And someone who's 20 just hasn't had the chance to read as much as someone who's 50 or 60, you know, it's, it's just... So a sensible studio should hire people who are young, uh, who may have the advantage of being maybe more connected to, to their peers, uh, but also older people who have that advantage in, in, in experience. So uh, basically, if I were to try to to sign up with a with a game design studio, uh, I would capitalize on that and say, "Hey, yeah, okay, well, I'm I'm new, but I've had all these other experiences that make me a valuable asset to your team." And any HR uh, department worth their salt should recognize that. And frankly, if someone dis uh, basically discriminates you uh, based on your age, it doesn't matter what your age is; it's not the right fit for you. It's just the way it is. Uh, and there are other opportunities and uh, you, you just got, I mean, you can't change your age anyway, right? So <laughs> uh, just, just try and see the advantages in it uh, and, and don't see it as a liability. It, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it goes for everything, right? You, you got to find uh, what makes that an asset uh, and, and sort of capitalize on that. So my two cents. Yeah, 100% agree. You said it better than I could. So that was one definitely true. Awesome. Thank you both. What I can add to that is uh, I, I don't consider myself that old. I'm 29, but I am older than most of the applicants in the game writing narrative design industry. And um, it is really important what he said to really capitalize on your life experiences because like you have probably held jobs that were really, really impactful and will come out in your narrative design. Um, I think if you don't have a lot of, if you don't have a big resume as it is, but you have a lot of life experience, uh, I would definitely recommend getting your like cover letter looked at a lot um, so you can really present that in a sound way. And then um, just, just for the record, I am an old man, so I'm, I'm not in my 50s just yet, but um, so anybody who's like, oh, I'm 29, I'm old. It makes me it makes me smile, um, and because I remember being twenty nine, like yeah, I'm getting old. But seriously, there's so much life ahead of you. Um, it's 
<laughs> so it, it, again, you know, it, it's just a matter of perspective, and there's really no right or wrong or good or bad, and just you know, uh, it's it's cool. Are there any other questions? Okay, um, brilliant. Then I'm going to take that as meaning that um, I explained everything perfectly and everyone now understands how to create great quests. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone.